All right. So uh, the presentation format uh, for all of the CSAs is going to look like this, where we're going to talk about the program performance, which will include community priorities, 2020 program results, 2024 future goals, community outcomes, and provide you an update on the equity and inclusion lens. On the flip side, we will also present the financial performance along with the program performance, which will include 2023's original budget and 2024's recommended budget. As I mentioned earlier, there are five CSAs and we are going to talk about just a CSA in this presentation. Justice CSA has two community priorities, advance police community relations and promote just and safe city. For the community priority, promote just and safe city, uh, there was a 3.8% or little over $3 million increase in the budget when we compare the numbers to 2023. Advanced police community relation priority increased by 1.6%, um, and this is largely due to the lower rates for vacant positions in the mediation, mediation response group. In total, there were 13 additional FTEs. Um, as you can see in the bottom, we went from 592 FTEs in 2023 to 605 FTEs in 2024. Police operation had a net increase of 14 F FTEs, and this is due to the uh, budgeting for two recruit classes and lateral transfers. However, due to the higher number of vacancies and the timing of the recruit class in the later part of the year, police personnel budget is 3.9% lower than 2023. Um, also, I want to add police budget uh, is also impacted by that grant um, and that's why we are showing, seeing a reduction in police personnel budget when we compare it to 2023. Um, on the other hand, police contracts and materials combined with the capital allocation and transfers out increased almost 37 percent which we will discuss in detail in later. In this chart, you can see the percent increase for various departments that are in Justice CSA. The largest increase is in police, police budget, which is 5.8%. Uh, municipal court has a decrease of 8.8%, and this is largely due to the fact that we are um, not funding the same amount for the court's case management system in 2024 as we did in 2023 uh, because the maintenance cost is lower in 2024. And HRC has a reduction of 30.6%, and this is largely due to um, us not having the MBAC and doing the re reorganization um, in the absence of MBAC. This is a five-year trend. Um, as you see here, uh, starting in 2019, uh, 2020 saw a little bit of dip in actual um, expenses. And this is largely due to the fact that we were in the pandemic. Um, but from 2020, we saw a 2.6% growth in 2021 and even a larger growth in 2022 at 7.6%. Because of the vacancies that we're experiencing, especially in police, um, we are projected to end the year 6.1% higher than 2022. So it is a lower growth than what we experienced from 2021 to 2022. However, the 2024's budget, which has a uh, fully funded, all positions are fully funded, um, whether they're vacant or filled, um, is seeing an increase of 8.4% from 2023 projection. So before I get started here, um, this slide was created uh, last year, and this is uh, because of the fact that we did the organization-wide restructuring of the performance management program. So that's why we're able to present to you the financial information along with the program performance. Um, prior to last year, if you recall, we presented financial financial performance separate from the program performance because we didn't have the linkage necessary to create this slide specifically. 
Um, and so we are going to, um, as the departments are presenting their their program performance, we will um, mention the priority um, as well as the strategic objective, and then the departments are going to present their program performance um, uh, and compare their numbers to 2022 Q3, 2023 Q3, and talk about their 2024 target. The very first program area, or the very first priority, I should say, is advanced police community relations. Um, and the program area is media mediation center. Um, for mediation center, the personnel budget is up 3.9%, and this is just an inflationary growth in personnel for mediation. Um, contracts and materials are, however, down 9.6%. The largest reduction in contracts and material is in professional services for a one-time funding. Um, that was in 2023. And then the decrease uh, in mediation center is offset by an increase in fleet charges um, because uh, fleet operation is planning to increase the rate in 2024. Um, and so the fleet charges are higher in 2024 than 2023. With that, I am going to hand it over to Michelle to talk through the program performance. Thank you, Abby. So our strategic strategic objective is to provide a productive and constructive process for people in Tampa. And so we're measuring the number of 911 calls matched to the mediation response unit. So if you remember, that program started last year in May. And so in 2022, we had about 1,100 calls for service. And now we are up to um, almost 2,300 this year. So our goal for 2024 will be a target of 3,000 um, calls for service, either through the 911 system, direct call-ins, um, or referrals from the police department. Um, the number of referrals that result in intervention per quarter we're holding pretty steady. We're, we wanted a goal of 55% um, this year, and we're up to um, 65, I'm sorry, 70% right now. So we're going to put our, um, our goal in 2024 at 60%. So some future goals that we have for um, the Mediation Center um, is to train and recruit new community volunteers. Uh, we have, uh, we're finally increasing the number of volunteers that we have. Um, the, pandem the pandemic hit us hard because uh, we weren't able to train as many people. So we will continue um, our mediation training next year and beyond. Uh, we also want to not just meet with people while they're in conflict. We want to meet people out in the community by doing um, outreach and marketing. And so we're trying to connect with over 5,000 community members next year. And then we will continue to provide education training for our mediation responders and our staff folks. And um, we will continue to do outreach for the uh, police complaint program and offer materials in different languages. And so for our equity and inclusion lens, um, we want to improve access to social and economic services for poor, vulnerable, and at-risk Daytonians. And uh, this year, the Mediation Center and the MRU served over 2,300 members and participated in marketing and outreach events at for 120 different events. So our uh, strategy for 2024 is to continue to create positive and effective interactions with customers through the mediation response unit, um, community engagement initiatives through partners with different service providers. And then the data we're using to support the equity and inclusion initiatives are um, customers' case data, um, engagement outcomes, and then service provider data. Right, next we're switching priority. Um, next priority is promote just and safe city. Uh, the program area in this priority, the very first one is civil rights compliance. Uh, for civil rights compliance, the personnel budget is down 23.6%. Um, this personnel decrease is largely the movement of position. And so that's why we're seeing a decrease uh, not necessarily uh, because we have less people. Contracts and material ha also has a decrease of 72.4%, and this decrease is largely due to the need, change in need because we have less people in this specific program area. The contracts and material budget has also been reduced to uh, reflect the personnel. With that, I am going to hand it over to Berletta. Thank you, so the strategic objective for uh, civil rights compliance is promote a culture 
of fair treatment, justice, mm -hmm. and inclusion for all residents. Oversee civil rights programs to ensure access and equal opportunity. With measurements, the measures of progress includes uh, percentage of official appeals closed with resolution. And we're looking at for 24 percent uh, and we've been doing that across the board since 22, our target as well as our results. The future goals are the Community Appeals Board, CAP, will continue to hear appeals, conduct research, and make policy recommendations to the commission and provide outreach and education to the community. Continue to provide supportive service to citizens who contact HRC, with potential and active police complaints. Continue to partner with DPD, area magistrates and lawyers to provide Know Your Rights workshops at UD, Wright State, Honitz, Meadowdale, just to mention a few. With historic attendance rates of at least 20 attendees for each event. For um, so for this one, it is uh, we're looking at the number of cases closed with resolution. And if you noticed on twenty three thus far, we're at ninety five percent, and looking for ninety percent for next year. That's our target. Number of closed formal civil rights cases. Uh, we're looking to target thirteen. With 24, and this year thus far, we're at nine. The future goals the Office of Justice and Inclusion will further increase housing, employment, discrimination, investigation, caseloads, proactively pursue enforcement actions against discrimination, discriminatory organizations and offer ongoing trainings along with outreach to our community around civil rights. Continue to provide DVD and fire training trainees with community orientation and cultural competency training. Propose city ordinance changes that will strengthen Dayton's position as a pro progressive civil rights champion in the state of Ohio. Looking through uh, our equity and inclusion lenses, we have two uh, to highlight this morning. Oversee implementation of Community uh, Appeals Board. Uh, and so far, we've held six Community Appeals Board hearings. 2024 Equity and Inclusion Extend Outreach of CAB and Improve Implementation of Hearing Process. And some of the supportive documentations is uh, the May 21 Community Driven Reform Initiative Report. Last but not least, uh, the other lens would be enforce the anti-discriminatory ordinance of the city of Dayton. And there are several different outcomes that are listed there. And I would like to pull out one would be to earn uh, $74,000 in federal grant dollars for federal compliant complaint investigations and outreach. Provide uh, educational and outreach events, spread awareness of services provided by HRC. And the documents are listed there. It was the 2019 third generation City of Dayton disparity study and also the 2023 Department of Human Housing and Urban Development Fair Housing Assistance Program Guidance Memorandum. Um, continue with the same priority of promote just in the city. Our next program area is Laws Criminal Division. Um, for this division, when we compare the personnel budget to 2023, it's up by 5.3%, uh, which is a an expected inflationary increase in Laws Criminal Division. 
Contracts and materials are up 22.4% when compared to 2023. And this is largely associated with the user fee for the justice web system. Um, that's a new expense in 2024's budget, hence the increase of 22.4%. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Stephanie. Thank you, Abby. Um, strategic objective for the criminal division is to promote public safety and pursue interest uh, of justice for all. Uh, in an effort to achieve that objective, we have begun to start tracking the number of cases that are prosecuted by our office. Um, as you know, we are responsible for prosecuting adults only who commit misdemeanor offenses within the city of Dayton's limits. Um, in 2022, we prosecuted a total of 2,984 um, criminal cases, and, and we prosecuted a total of 4,307 traffic cases. Target is kind of hard. The purpose of this slide and this information was really to impress upon you on how many cases our office uh, prosecutes when we're fully staffed. And there's like one more fully staffed. This is nine prosecutors. Um, but uh, in this year, we prosecuted a total up to the third quarter. We prosecuted 3,126 criminal cases and 3,539 traffic cases or a total of 6,665 cases. We have prosecutors, one prosecutor assigned to each of the five court judges' courtrooms, and the, so that came out to be 1,110 cases per prosecutor so far in uh, the three quarters of this 2023. We've also tracked uh, the number of search warrants. Uh, search warrants have been reviewed by the Dayton Prosecutor's Office for many, many years. Um, with Mr. Sexton's um, I'm going to call him transfer, if you will, over to the police department. He has been the one who has carried the weight for uh, 2023. And at this point, he has reviewed 555 warrants. Um, it's important, uh, I think, having a two-tier review system is very um, effective. Most of the municipalities, when I attend meetings, a lot of the prosecutor's office don't bother to review it. Just goes straight to a, a judge for review. Um, Mr. Sexton and I have asked all of our detectives that come to us for search warrant review to let us know if any of them have ever been successfully challenged in the court of common pleas. And to this date, none of them. They've been challenged, but none of them have been successful. And so I think, again, that two-tier review um, is very, very important. Um, in addition to uh, what we do is in, in the case prosecution, uh, a number of years ago, Marcy's Law was passed on the ballot through the state of Ohio, which was victims' rights. Our office has two victim advocates, and I am proud to say uh, that um, with Marcy's Law, they outlined the rights that you automatically get as a victim, and then they um, had a number that were new rights, if you will, that had to be requested. Our office has been on the forefront, and the new ones that have been um, that can be requested, we have been providing those, those, um, those services as it is. The one new thing that we may, uh, that we will be changing is the redaction of victim information. And that is something that they can opt into. And I think the police department has made provisions for that with their police reports as well. So I'm happy, like I said, I, I'm, I'm proud of the job that our victim advocates do. Um, the future goals would be to continue to aggressively prosecute the criminal and traffic cases, to aggressively prosecute and procure convictions in all pedestrian safety cases, um, if multiple offenses have been charged, the prosecutor, when possible, should obtain a conviction for the pedestrian safety offense in addition to any other offenses. This has really gone down. We really haven't seen many of those charges presented to our office. And, of course, we're going to continue to review search warrants to ensure that probable cause exists uh, for the warrants to be able to be issued. Uh, the next measure of progress is uh, we're tracking the percentage uh, conviction rate for gun charges. In 2022, we had an 85.3% um, result. Our target had been 85%. In 2022, as of the third quarter, we are at 92%. Um, I'm proud to say that in 2023, as of the end of the quarter, we are 100% conviction rate at this point in time. Now, as you know, um, most of the gun charges taken are fel felony charges. And so the types of um, weapon charges that we'll see in our in our uh, prosecution is going to be uh, using or possessing weapons while intoxicated, uh, an improper handling of a firearm in a motor vehicle, and then to a lesser extent now, given the changes in the gun laws, carrying concealed weapons. 
Um, but I do want to let you know that our office makes a very concerted effort. You know, there are a number of ways that you can be disqualified and therefore not permitted to be able to carry a gun. And so um, to outline one, uh, the biggest bang for the buck is a resisting arrest conviction. So within, if you have um, been convicted of that offense, uh, there's a 10 year look back period. You're not permitted to have um, a gun. And so when we see those types of offenses, that is the preferred offer to plead to that so we can pass that. Um, I can tell you right now that a lot of times you'll see these resistings with felonies. And so I make it a point of approving those charges, even though the county has a felony, because I don't know if they would maybe dismiss the misdemeanor in exchange for a plea to that, that felony, but that is an important conviction to have. And so that's why I make sure we try and keep those charges in the municipal court. Um, we have a total of, for year to date in 23, a total of 14 gun charges. And we do request um, that the guns be confiscated and destroyed. And we have the 14. Uh, 10 guns were forfeited. I'm proud to say all of our judges have agreed to do that. Um, but, and so that, that's helpful. I know the chief is probably going to talk to you about the total number of guns that they have confiscated. Um, and so our target for conviction for guns, again, is going to be 85%. Uh, with respect to drug abuse instrument cases, our um, year-to-date results in 2022 were 90.9%. .9%. .9%. The target had been 85%. Um, in 2022, our third quarter, we were at 91%. And in 2023, our third quarter, we're now at 92%. Um, we continue to um, aggressively prosecute these cases. Uh, our numbers are smaller. Um, I'm hoping partly because the counseling that we're requesting is, is effective and working for some people. But the county has changed how they approve their um felony drug charges. It used to be that they would approve the charge prior to receiving the lab reports. And so now they are requiring the lab results first before they approve those charges. And so oftentimes when you see like a, you know, a felony drug, cocaine or heroin or, or fentanyl or whatever, you're going to see maybe a syringe that goes with it. They're going to, we're going to delay um, taking that charge pending the county's approval. And so the detectives come back to us and let us know if the county is not going to take the felony drug charge, then we can go back and, and at least take that drug abuse instrument. Um, so we continue to aggressively pursue those, those, um, those cases in the attempt to try and get them to counseling. Uh, as far as the equity and inclusion lens, we still work to address gun activity throughout state neighborhoods. Uh, as I indicated, that the 100% conviction rate was achieved in the third quarter. Um, we're very proud of that. Um, in 2024, the equity inclusion strategy is to continue to prosecute the misdemeanor gun charges while adapting to significant changes in the gun possession laws. Uh, the data that we used uh, was consensus data, database, and social uh, determinants of health. With respect to um, second would be to allocate resources to assist the most vulnerable populations with the addiction treatment needs. Um, again, we achieved a 92% conviction rate in the third quarter or year end of third quarter um, in this particular category. And our strategy continues to be um, using those convictions to request uh, treatment in lieu of jail so that the individual can be rehabilitated and returned to the community. And again, we use the same um, databases, the consensus data, court database, and the social determinants. Continuing with the same promoted and safety priority, uh, the next program area is police patrol operation and operations support. Um, in this program area, the total personnel budget is down by 11.2% when we compare it to 2023's original budget. And this is largely driven by the movement of expenses um, for personnel from general fund to the ORPA grant. Um, vacancies are also driving the personnel cost to be down um, because of the fact that um, we are seeing increased vacancies in 2023. Um, we are uh, doing two recruit classes in 2024 to fill these vacancies. However, uh, the people who are coming in are at a lower rate than the people who are leaving. So we're seeing a decrease in personnel cost. Uh, when we look at contracts and material and compared to 2023's original budget, they are up 
8.1%. Unpleasant material in police patrol operations and operations support includes various different items. Um, just to highlight a few, um, we have an increase for other professional services, which is related to the uh, canine boarding, training, and care. Uh, supplies and material costs also have an increase, and this is largely due to the addition additional budget that's needed for SWAT supplies. Um, and um, also equipment maintenance um, is also uh, higher in 2024 than it was in 2023. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Chief to talk through the performance management. Hey, good morning, Commissioner, good morning. Good morning. Before I get into that part of it, I wanna kind of give a shout out to Michelle and her staff with MRU. Um, it's been a, a, a great program for I know it came from the police reform. Um, you know a program successful when cops who are working will ask if somebody is available to take some of the calls. Um, that reduction, we mm -hmm. hope that actually is a lot more than what it is right now, but I know they're working on the staffing part of it. It really does help. And some of those calls we'll never get to because they're such low priority. And then the, and the perspective from a citizen is that, you know, police don't care and all of a sudden the city is taking very proactive measure. So I want to thank her. They're, they work really well with our, 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 our staff and and the major Malton was part of the group um, that came up with conditions as to how to how to get that going. So uh, thank you for that from a from a police perspective because that does, does definitely helps us. Um, for this, our, our strategic objective uh, on the uh, first one in this category is to fully implement uh, evidence based practices that support a community policing model with intensive community participation. We serve as a regional model for developing a safe environment on public streets for pedestrians and vehicle traffic. The measures that we have uh, here um, uh, to uh, for progress are our priority one response, our priority two response, and percentage of, of time spent on dispatch calls. As you can see, for priority one response and two, we, we are meeting uh, the standard that we have set for ourselves, which is really a national and nationwide standard, which is responding to less than uh, in less than seven minutes. Uh, our our metric right now is uh, four point four minutes, and that's with all the staffing losses that we've had. I think that. Uh, uh, our effort to kind of reorganize and pull out of our personnel at the, the front end, uh, I think is, is helping us in this in this area, because if we had not done that, I think that number would have been uh, a lot higher. Uh, same thing with our priority two, we are at eight minutes, uh, uh, and we want to be at less than nine minutes, and we're uh, going to try to continue to achieve those numbers for, for, the, for next year. Um, our last number is a percentage of time spent on dispatch calls. Um, so far this year, we're at 60%. We were last year, we were at 58%. And here again, I think uh, deploying our, our resources inside of uh, special units back to patrol quite a bit because at times throughout the year, especially in summer months, we are in the high 70s. And when you are the closer you got to 60% or higher, you, you get to be just a call taking the part. Um, and how do you want to be more proactive? You, you want the balance you want. Is to be at fifty percent or less, which our central business district is. But our east and west and east get a number if they're higher than sixty percent. Um, so, uh, as we said, from a staffing perspective, um, which is has an effect on response time, uh, we are we have had forty one officers resign or retire so far this year. Uh, the forty first officers were leaving in November. We just uh, was still retiring. Um, our, our attrition goal was 41, so we've already we already had that number. Uh, current staffing level is 326, where we are, we're supposed to be at average of 365. Now that 326 includes six of our lateral officers who just started their uh, academy uh, two weeks ago, so they have another eight weeks to go, and then they will have 16 weeks of uh, field training uh, to go before they are going to be solo patrol. The 114 academy class has. 17 recruits who will graduate uh, on number 17, and then we'll begin their uh, FTO pro process again. Um, uh, we continue to have challenges uh, with uh, filling overtime uh, with contract and supplemental. Um, despite despite uh, implementing the process to accept fewer and fewer overtime challenges, we're still having um, uh, challenges. So there's a strong need to have more sworn officers because uh, our guys are tired. I think that you, you're seeing that over the last two or three years, uh, where you have so much work and reduction in, in the number of people over there. So we, we definitely see that showing up in our overtime. Uh, I, mean, I think we feel maybe half up of our time is that. I think that, that might be a, 
best case scenario. Uh, future goals uh, through robust recruiting on, on both lateral and new recruits. Uh, department is seeking to improve our staffing. Uh, we will continue to collaborate with our civil service to increase recruiting and hiring efforts to maintain personnel numbers. You, we, you know that we are going to be going to two classes uh, and, and really three classes and a ladder class, and that's to make sure that we reduce that time between the time that somebody applies and somebody's able to get in. Because I can tell you that, uh, and as some, as a father of one of those guys who really regret the departments who, when he doesn't hear back from someone, um, we want to make sure, make sure that number, that time is reviewed. So within a few months of you applying, you can show progress. Or they're still, they'll just go somewhere else. And they do. So the, right now, there's a class, recruit class budgeted for 32 officers that will start in March of 2024. Um, a second recruit class will, be, will start in October 2024. And there's also in the budget is a ladder class for 2024 that we already, we, we just started one and we'll have another one in 2024. Um, other thing we're trying to do is also looking for ways to reduce the workload of our patrol officers by by doing things a little bit differently. Uh, one of that was the how we're handling accidents. So if it's not a injury related accident uh, or if the car is not uh, towable, we are we're responding to the scene, but then we're just having them exchange information. Uh, we are just entering a contract with Lexic Nexus to make sure that we are able to expand the number of calls that you report online. Um, and also uh, looking at ways to expand our telephone reporting unit for those individuals that might be technology challenged and maybe can't get online, but still need to talk to someone. So looking at really the long-term goal is to about a third of our reports to be done online or through a telephone reporting unit. That gives us time to be able to react to those, the very calls that we, that we respond to. Good evening, Chiefs. Yes, yes ma'am. Good evening. Mm -hmm. um, very quick question. Could you please tell me how many recruits are in the, the class? So right. So right now, 17. We started with 32, and that's a that's also a trend that we're seeing, where people are uh, just leaving after. I mean, a couple of them left on the first week, so six months in the process. They're like, "This is not for me." So we're seeing that, and I've talked to other people. I just came from San Diego at, at a at an national conference, and that is now a, a new phenomenon that we have to, to deal with because that just wasn't the case even 10 years ago, let alone you know 30 years ago when I joined. So the, we are. I thought we were unique. We are looking at our training. How we're doing training. Uh, uh, internally, so I know uh, Major uh, Mullins behind me is, and his training staff looking at how do we do, how do we get to the standard, maybe not in the same way, but still get to the standard. Uh, so, thank you. Um, the, uh, just to follow up on that question, any rationale in terms of why you're leaving uh, early in the process? I, I different. Sometimes they're like, well, this is not what I thought police work was what. <laughs> we have to train you for, you know, <clears throat> our training has evolved quite a bit and we are. You know, more of a garden uh, mindset, but we still have to prepare you for uh, the worst case scenario. And when we when we do that, a lot of times that's the point where we're like, well, even though those things, um, each individual also might not deal with that on a daily basis, but they do occur on a daily basis. And then that becomes an issue. It's like, well, that's not what I wanted to do. Um, and then they say, well, that's not it. Even though four of those who left are in the process of the next class. So I don't know what the story there is for that. <laughs> We made a, made, made a hasty decision because I know with one of them, we tried to talk them out of it because we saw there was just a, a stress, you know, 30 weeks of stress. And we, we told them there's, there, there is an, a letter tunnel. Um, they didn't, I just believe us. And, but somehow they're back in the process for the next class. So we'll, uh, we'll, when we move civil service, we'll, we'll, we'll see you there. We're ready for it. Just for historical context, we would typically lose one to two, possibly three recruits throughout the academy. Um, to lose almost 50% of a class is really alarming. Um, but I, I assure you we're digging into the root causes and making adjustments accordingly. We can't afford that. The other measure uh, that we have is the increase in farms recovered. Reduction in traffic fatalities and reduction in injury crashes. So the, for, for the firearms in 2022, we recovered 751 firearms through uh, this quarter, third quarter. Um, and our goal was to increase the number by 10%. So far, we have recovered 796 weapons. So we, we are on target to recover more weapons than we did last year. Um, uh, we have a goal to maintain the number of weapons recovered in 2024. We know that taking weapons off the street definitely helps uh, 
reduce our violent crime. Um, one of the troubling trends that we see is that we have a 75% increase in juveniles with weapons. We have 93 of those cases, we have juveniles. We also know from our, a lot of our, our uh, we'll, we'll get to when we get to the number of, uh, uh, of violent crime incidences that are uh, a lot of our tr trigger pullers, shooters, are actually juveniles. Uh, we just closed a case where we, we got uh, several guns off uh, people who are under 18 and who have been linked them to different shootings and not just Dayton in the region itself. Um, so I think that is also contributing to some of the factors we're going to see there. Um, from a traffic fatality perspective, our, our, our uh, you know, goal was to reduce traffic fatalities by 5%. Um, so far, by the end of this quarter, we have had 17 fatalities. I will tell you that 17 is too many, um, but we were at 24 last year, so we have a reduction of almost 30% uh, in this category. Excuse me, Chief. Yes, yes ma'am. Do you have any um, analysis on that data in terms of that number, the cause, the intersections, is it do you have any particulars? Yeah, I think the, I think the, the, the reasonable reduction, I think, is that we are, uh, especially with our photo enforcement, as we get complaints from our community, we are deploying them in different places. Uh, and we then see a reduction in number of traffic or speeding complaints, which is usually the, 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 the cause of the accidents is people are driving way too fast for the, for the conditions, um, their conditions, and also what's allowed by the state. We definitely see speed as, a, as an issue more than anything else. Um, and I think the work that we have done in Gettysburg, especially with our public work partners in the, in the city, I think has a, we believe has a had a factor in the fact that we have a reduction in both categories of traffic fatalities and traffic accidents. Now, you know, we would like everything to be zero, uh, but I think we're making, uh, and that's what staffing challenges, but I think technology of uh, being able to be moving our, some of our assets around, I think is really, really uh, is helping quite a bit because we just don't have the manpower to put somebody um, yeah, that answers your question. Okay. Um, for traffic uh, crashes, we also have a reduction of seven percent um, to through this quarter. Um, and uh, one of the things we're we're continuing to keep complaints on speeding, so for ATVs and all that, and we're moving our especially our photo enforcement things around. Uh, we are also working with our state legislators to maybe do some different things with the effective winning, which I just found out today that. A bill uh, came out of the committee and it's going to be voted on 11 15, I believe. That's going to address some of the hooning issues that we have dealt with. Um, so I know there's some changes from the time that I saw the bill, so I don't know what those changes are, uh, but anything would be, would be a uh, welcome addition. In the past, we talked about we have a reduction. Um, so, future goals is to continue to partner with agencies such as Ohio State. Uh, the goal for gun reduction initiatives to focus on individuals committing gun crimes. And we are doing that. We are focusing on individuals that we know of uh, who are committing crimes so we can put some of our uh, uh, officers who are, are not in patrol, be able to target those individuals. And I think that the gun numbers reflect that because we're not just making stops on anybody and everybody. I mean, we're, we're really are intentional as to the individuals that we are all committing harm in this community and Causing a lot of harm to to our folks. So I think we, that's going to be continued focus. Um, we will work with our city partners and use our foreign enforcement uh, to make sure that uh, people they see us in some way or other. And then also our continue to drive our education for safety in the community. Um, we, we are definitely very very. We want to make sure that we prevent things before before they're they're occurring. We'll slow down just a little bit. Okay, continuing with the same priority of promote just and safe city. Um, the next program area in the CSA is police investigations, the phone services, and community services. Um, for this program area, I want to caveat first, this is not just general fund. This includes the photo enforcement funds um, and a couple other smaller funds. Um, with that, the personnel cost in this program area is up 8.2% when we compare it to 2023's original budget. And this is largely driven by the larger recruit classes. As Keith mentioned, we are planning for two recruit classes. Um, that's why the personnel cost is higher. Um, 
and the uh, increased cost is offset by the increased attrition that we're seeing in 2023. Um, in contracts and material, as you can see in that smaller table above the increase, um, $17.5 million um, is contracts and material in 2024's budget, which is a 40.1% increase when we compare it to 2023. Um, that includes $11 million in contracts and material. Um, $1.6 million in capital cost um, and transfer outs uh, are in the amount of $5 million. Um, because of that $5 million transfer out that we're planning in 2024 from the Board Enforcement Fund to the General Fund, we are seeing that 40.1% increase. That increase is largely driven by that transfer. Um, contracts and material are also up a little bit compared to uh, 2023. And that's largely because of the uh, gear cost that we need for the increased recruit classes. Because we're doing two recruit classes, we also need to purchase uh, gear for, for all of those recruits. Um, and so that's why contracts and material are also higher a little bit. Uh, and professional services um, also includes a uh, added budget for technology improvement and maintenance cost. Um, and so that's why we're seeing that total increase of 40.1%. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Chief. So again, something I'd be saying kind of brought talk to my mind uh, just today in the morning from recruit perspective, mm -hmm. training perspective, uh, PARF, which is one of the uh, research uh, organizations for uh, police executives, pushed out a Justice Department report where we'll be looking at recruiting, retention, and how we do training. So I know I just forward that to uh, to all my executive staff to look at it and add it. I briefly looked at it, and they talked about some of those things, same factors that we we're already working on about reducing that number of the cycle from between the time that you come in to, uh, the, 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 you know, apply for department and the time that you get into the academy. Looking at your academy training and really de determining what is it you really need to do and what are things that you still no longer need, right? What is it that you're, and, and, and looking at what the community is looking for, uh, looking at the, your standards, what are some, some things that you can uh, adjust and what are some things that are unacceptable, right? If you have domestic violence conviction, we, we don't want you law enforcement. Tell them the same thing. But the other things, and looking at behavior that somebody might have done, especially at the younger age, um, you know, not to be so critical of some of those behaviors uh, that maybe we have in the past. All of those things that we reported. And so Abby said, talked about recruiting. So it, uh, it, it was a point on my thing, and I forgot to, to mention that part of this. So from a strategic perspective, our, uh, our, uh, our objective is to uh, ensure that victims of crime receive quality and compassionate investigative services. Uh, to lead the re region in utilizing technology as a force multiplier and to support local projects and events by providing public safety services to Dayton residents and businesses. Increase trust and transparency between the community and police by having a highly skilled safety force that is trained in best practices for developing community engagement. So uh, the, the first me measure of, uh, of for progress is reduction in part one drug crimes. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, at the end of the third quarter, we have an increase of 5.1%, not a decrease. Even though the goal that we have also was a, was a reduction. Uh, our goal for 2024 is going to be to reduce the reduction uh, with the previous five-year data, not just the last year data. I mean, when I look at a longer trend, year-to-year, um, -year, that you might have ups and downs that are not indicative of what we're you're seeing uh, in our community. When we looked at our increases, we were looking at the uh, other like, like cities, what they're doing, and what the na nationwide trend is. So if you look at uh, uh, large Ohio cities, Columbus and Cleveland, they're both experienced uh, homicide influence assault increases. Columbus has seen a almost a 10% increase in homicides. Uh, Cleveland is at about 16.9%, so almost 17% increase. Um, for felonious assault, Columbus uh, is at 9% increase, and Cleveland is a 12% increase. Cincinnati, however, has experienced a decrease, a great decrease in both homicides, 27% and felonious assault. Um, we'll go into it just a little bit. Mid-sized cities like Toledo, uh, they are also uh, seeing a reduction in both homicides uh, by 30% uh, and influence assault by 28%. Uh, Toledo implemented the Cure Violence Program in 2021, uh, which is something that we are kind of looking at. Um, and that's like violence interrupters who are working with police, but not really working with police. We're from, you know, at, a, at a macro level, we're giving, police are giving them information, but at a macro level, they, they work independently. There's no, there's no quick pro, quick pro, pro in that. We're just do your thing and make sure that people don't hurt themselves. So they're seeing a great reduction. <laughs> Three years later, they're seeing that. Because last year, they weren't seeing it. Um, 
Exxon, uh, Akron, uh, it was a little bit. They also experienced a, a reduction in homicide by 39%, but they're seeing an increase in felonious assault. Uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan, which is pretty similar to our from a population perspective, uh, they're experiencing a decrease in both homicides and felonious assault. We have looked at what Cincinnati is doing. So a lot of their, anyone what Toledo is doing uh, in addition to cure violence, and we started doing that, so they have a, a real time crime. Uh, uh, What's this called? CJIC, right? CJIC. Yeah, Justice Center, where yeah. they're getting information in real time and then uh, assign the detectives to go respond to that. Um, what, one of the agencies, there might be another one, they're also looking at uh, when you know somebody has done something to show up and, and knock on the door and saying, we know you're doing it. Uh, these are all the resources we're going to get out of business. Yeah, and that's the success. So we're, we've are we already started focusing from a gun violence perspective, really uh, targeting into those few individuals that are in our city. Uh, and I think that's why even with the laxing of the gun laws that we have, we're still seeing increase in uh, catching individuals with guns they should not have that. So uh, a lot of it is uh, uh, issues with uh, our, the most important capital people. When you're 40 people short, difficult to kind of change course a little bit, but we're looking as to well, how we can use different technology and some people to go to adapt some of the modeling that, they, yeah. that they're using to reduce the harm that's been done in this community. Uh, future goals is to uh, continue to develop neighborhood safety plans in conjunction with community leaders to identify strategies to combat gun violence. Uh, we talked about pure violence as potential. Now uh, there's some there's some costs associated with that. Uh, and we, we have given to the, to the, to the city manager. Uh, we, we continue to use our uh, technology, NIBIN, uh, uh, system to link investigate and gun crimes. Uh, this this involves collecting shell casings from the scene and looking to other crime. As I said, just just maybe two weeks ago, uh, three individuals that we arrested that were we kind of knew were trigger pullers. The guns were recovered from them. They were used in multiple shootings um, in our region. Uh, maybe a few months ago, we arrested somebody with a gun and found out that the gun was involved in a homicide in Columbus. So we called Columbus to carry on the investigation. Uh, that's my other part of that. Okay, I'm sorry, did you go back? No, you're good. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, this, uh, the measure here are uh, two measures. Uh, one is number of grants applied for and the amount awarded. Um, and the second is youth contact. You kind of heard from Abby about the number of the amount of money that's being already paid uh, for our police officer from a grant. Well, so for this year, uh, we are, uh, we have, uh, we already have a $4.5 million grant, staffing grant, that's going to pay for officers to, to, uh, to next year. Um, this year, we applied for four grants, so for a total of $718,000. Uh, this month, we just applied for a body-worn camera grant for additional services for auto-tagging, redaction, and transcription services for about $175,000. Uh, we will not know if we even awarded this grant until later this year. But in the past, we've been pretty successful in, in getting grants, so... Shout out for to Joan back there and uh, Meredith. Both of them are very, very active in looking to see if uh, somebody will pay for some services. Uh, youth contacts, if you see our, our target is uh, 10,000. Uh, this is positive youth contacts. This is not a negative connotation. So I can, I'm uh, pleased to say that uh, uh, our goal was 10,000. And so, um, uh, so far we have almost had 10,000 interactions. I still have a few more months uh, to go. Um, are those inner uh, just um, one-offs, or is this like when you have events and you're counting? It, it could be one-offs, or it could be you know some of the programs that we have. You know, you know uh, Lisa and, and Tom's High School, and she has contacts with them. Our, our recruiting officer has contacts with them. Um, then you have uh, our community engagement team does that. So it's it's a it's a wide variety of things. It's not we're we are trying to go to wherever we need to. We make sure we make a positive impact on the. On, the, on our, our young folks, because that's the people that we need in the workforce also, mm -hmm. uh, and provide them a positive uh, outlook. So it's not just one way of capturing it. Uh, some of it is events. So obviously, you get the best bank for a buck is when we have a lot of, lot of uh, kids. We have a youth program that we do, so we you know, every year, um, we do a lot of different things. We look at that, uh, positive contact with, with, the, with our younger generation. Yeah. So last year, we I think we were at 6,000, uh, and, and this year, we already had uh, Ten thousand and for actually for future our goal is going to at least be at ten thousand or, or more. 
future goals is to actively seek opportunities to uh, apply for grants and to fund our target enforcement activities, partner with resources from University of Dayton for grants and academic environments for specific data analysis, uh, continue to be active in schools and other existing programs, and seek opportunities to engage young people in the community, including creating a cadet program. And I will go talk about a cadet program in, in, in a little bit later as to what we're doing. Uh, I can tell you that uh, what we're doing at Pines High School, we uh, we have a waiting list. We have 42 kids in that program. And we have a waiting list to get in that program. That's and awesome. the cadet program will uh, hopefully, what the city is doing with, the, with Montgomery County Youth, will be a link for us to get these kids at a young age and, and mentor them uh, who are going to be from here. So hopefully we'll be able to retain them also because they are from here. Next slide. So uh, the next one is actually contacting uh, our, one of our customer service related goals is to for detectives to contact 90% of our victims uh, of a very crime within four days of the complaint being assigned. Uh, we're not meeting this goal. We're at 80, currently at 84%. And most of the deficiency is found in the property crime section, uh, which when we did the restaffing, we took a lot of people from the front end and we definitely uh, took a lot, of, a lot of people from, uh, from our property crime. Now, this is not because they're not, so we count when, when we contact them, not our attempt to contact them. So after four tries, if we can't get in touch with them, then we'll count that we that we try to contact them or we contact them. So if we don't, until four tries, then we don't count them. So 84% of big people are able, able to contact within four days. Uh, but there's some people who just, you know, either don't give us the right information, don't ask, don't, don't call us because they think we, we, we're contacting them for a wrong reason. We're just trying because they're victims. So, uh, so we're still we're still focusing on it. Uh, we contact them repeatedly, and after four tries, if you don't okay. call us back, then we'll count that as a we'll, we'll, we'll give up at that point. Uh, but on the properties, on the on the person side, we are achieving all the results because we are obviously in contact with us victims or people who are hurt with their close assault. Um, we obviously have two very unique units and. In our uh, at our children's center that we do deal with them, and also at the Home Justice Center where we deal with victims uh, at a very personal level, not in the department. That really is uh, the deficiency. Really is on the, on the property side, and we have a lot of cases. Um, and we had four thousand cases. We were at almost four thousand cases. Um, other thing that we have in, in property, there have been nearly two thousand stolen cars in twenty twenty three. Uh, which is an increase of nearly 200% um, from 2021 and nearly 90% increase from 2022. 61% of those cars are at Kias and Hunt. And that's still driving. Uh, we are, based on that increase, we are looking at best uh, ways to uh, manage the detectives for work, including things like where maybe we have a long tradition from staffing of investigating every single thing irrespective of whether we have any evidence or not, any information or not. We're looking to get out of that practice and kind of join the rest of the country and saying, if you don't have any uh, uh, investigative leads to you know, send them a letter saying, we don't have anything. So view that as a collective, but now maybe as an individual uh, contact. So that, that does take a lot of uh, workload. Um, the other uh, metric that we have up there is a, a number of applicants per recruiting cycle. Our, our Target is 500. We believe if we get to 500, we can get to 30 recruit uh, for each class. And uh, so far, we were we are at 689, uh, which is a which is a good number. So we're hoping that we're going to get to our number, and then we're looking at ways to keep them there because we got our, we got to the number last time. But obviously, we uh, things happen where uh, outside of three people, one guy who got injured, and two that we kind of let go ourselves because of the issue, behavior issues. The rest reflect. We're looking at what can we do to change what we need to do to make sure that we retain them. Because obviously they made the back on themselves. So that, that was not the, not the issue for them. Um, the future goals for us to is to streamline investigative workload, maintain a full full time recruiting officer, and continue to work with civil service to have multiple application cycles and testing dates, uh, testing times, dates, have candidates to fill each academy class. And then we will continue the partnership with the Dayton Public School teaching uh, criminal justice programs at Pontus High School. And we're looking at the implementing a cadet program. And that's a program where we're looking at what happens to uh, uh, our, our youth by the time they turn about 16, 17 years of age. 
then when they when they lack that structure, which is you know they graduate from high school, uh, what do we do from that point until they're 21 years of age? Because that's what we have to be the police officer. There's a lot of environmental issues that uh, good kids who are well-meaning peer pressure might get them a different way. Uh, so the cadet program that we're looking at uh, and partner with Montgomery County Youth is to be able to pay them and kind of hire them as cadets and then mentor them for three, four years. So if you if we get you at 16 years of age under the program, you can stay in that program until 24 years of age. There's also an income limitation that you can only be a certain percentage of poverty. So obviously that will target uh, our, our, our kids who, who need our assistance the most. And they tend to be uh, people of color minorities. So that's one of the needs that we already have. So we believe that we're gonna, with that program, and I think uh, Mr. Parlett is working on that for, for the whole entire city and we're ready to go. So I think hopefully by January of 2024, that will be in place and we'll start looking for uh, cadets that we can mentor. And as soon as they turn 21, have them apply for it to be a police officer with us uh, so we can uh, have, have a good line of it. Uh, workforce that actually are working uh, and from our area. Um, so that's that's the cadet program that we're doing. Yes. Uh, our next uh, is the diversity, equity, and inclusion lens. Uh, and the first lens is related to hiring. So the police department will uh, work to enhance the diversity of staff by focusing on strategies that stimulate the highest number of applicants from underrepresented segment of the community. Then 2023, uh, forty-six percent of the applicants were from uh, underrepresented community. Um, we have attended over five hundred different events in September, and uh, we have had more than nine thousand youth contacts and thirty-two thousand adult contacts. And uh, that number uh, that we had, even for the, the, the last class, that showed in the number of people that we hired. And that was uh, more than fifty percent of our. Uh, uh, folks that we hired as a result of just having a, a good pool coming in were uh, females and minorities. Uh, even after all the struggles that we have with, with retention, that number still has stayed the same. It's still 50% and more are females and minorities who are of the remaining 17 recruits that we have. Um, so I think bringing them in the right way, I think that it does, it does work. And that's how we're gonna continue that work. But the second lens related uh, to the uh, diversity equity is uh, training. All police department personnel must complete uh, annual DEI training to foster inclusive and equitable interactions. In 2023, uh, we had also complete training on interacting with community speaking Ali, and I'm going to mess up this thing. Uh, Demi? In your one. In your one. And that's from Rwanda. Uh, 112 to 113 academy classes completed the HRC Community Diversity Day training in March. I can tell you that was the way that the training was kind of going to redone after the lessons learned from the first training it was very positive, um, interacting uh, with, with our with our recruits. Um, and the 2024 strategy was we to continue the cultural and diversity training efforts. Uh, 114 115 academy classes will be attending HRC to Cultural Diversity Day in November. Uh, we're currently researching one of the things that Commissioner Joseph you introduced me to uh, was the Auschwitz Institute for Prevention of Genocide and Mass Atrocities. Uh, so we are actually working with the you know, care program to see if we can bring that to us for at least our senior leadership. Um, it's a tough thing to go through to hear some of the things that have occurred in the past that uh, you know, three generations before me uh, were responsible for, but memories are long. They still remember that. So a, a 25 year old kid doesn't have any recollection that doesn't understand that, but that understand the context. So uh, that was very positively done. So we are looking at that. So I know we're waiting for a proposal from them that uh, hopefully, you know, all grant funded. So uh, if, if they do what we think we're gonna do, we're, that's gonna be coming. We'll go to the city manager to accept that money to come to you to accept that. So that it's a, uh, I don't know if you ever, if you look at a repair program, you'll see what that program is about. And it's very, very positive. And I think it just makes you more aware of it. And also kind of sends you a lesson that, uh, Sometimes people in decision making people have policies, procedures that, that they enact, and that real law enforcement always have to be conscientious of the fact that just because somebody says so a law doesn't mean you, you have to enforce it every single time. Because that's what we did. We did enforce laws in the 40s and 50s that were in the books that the you honest know, were, you know, less than kind to people of color. Um, so. Thank you. 
Next, we have continuing in the same category, just in safe city, uh, we have clerk of court. Clerk of court's personnel budget in comparison to 2023's original budget is up by 2.1%. Um, it is not up by the annual wage growth, and this is uh, largely because of the turnover that we're experiencing in 2023. So the new hires are coming in at a lower rate than the people who are leaving. Um, and for contracts and material, the uh, percent has no change. Uh, we are continuing with the same budget as we did in 2023. With that, I am going to hand it over to the clerk of court. Thank you. I'm going to bring up the energy a little bit here. So thanks for having me, Commissioner and Mayor. <laughs> bring it up the energy. <laughs> Let's see. We'll get the touch of that. We'll see. Going off last year's uh, numbers here, we got 2023 year in uh, review. Criminal cases are up by 3% in Dayton Municipal Court. Those are cases that have been filed in the court. Uh, the civil cases are about 12% up. Those are likely resulted from eviction increases and wage garnishment increases that have been filed in the Dayton Municipal Court. The downward trends that we have been seeing is with traffic cases that have been filed and also parking tickets. Both of those are going down with the parking tickets. I think some of that is attributed to uh, we have an outdated police system. We used to do the computer authorized ones that the parking attendants would do. Now they have to handwrite it until they get a new system in place. And we're working with them to hopefully get that up and running and be compatible with our system. Uh, in 2023, we purchased a new case management system with the Dayton Municipal Court. This is called Equivant, the J-Work system. It is currently, we're having our kickoff meeting here in about a week, and then we'll start moving all that data and everything into that system. Hopefully with that new system, we'll see an increase in civil cases that are filed. Currently right now, we don't do uh, electronic filing. So if you do, if you're an attorney, you don't want to file because you have to come in person and file down in the Dayton Municipal Court. Uh, last year, we held 18 community clinics. These community clinics are usually either going to be a record sealing event, a vision event, or a licensed clinic event, or some other type of self-help center event that we are doing. Uh, we uh, held the following events with the Grace United Methodist Church. Goodwill was one of the largest ones that we did do. It was a very... Um, impactful one. We're hoping to do at least one in partnership with Goodwill every quarter. Uh, we're in, currently, I'm in conversations with Goodwill to accomplish that. Hopefully we'll be able to do more of those. Uh, we had four record ceiling events at the Dayton Metro Library. One was in Trotwood, uh, Maine, Southeast, and Vandalia. As uh, many of you could probably understand, in Dayton Municipal Court, usually we have individuals all across the county who have cases in our court. If you're driving in Dayton, it's likely that you're going to have something from Dayton. If you're in Montgomery County, any court, usually they'll have some case in Dayton along with these other courts. So hopefully we're able to give as many people licenses that is really the priority is to get people that are licensed so that they're not continually going into uh, court without driving under suspension. Uh, we've also partnered with a number of different courts. That's the Montgomery County Common Pleas Court and the federal court uh, to do more programs with their judges and trying to get people on a program to get in their license and hopefully cleaning up their records. Uh, we also conducted an all staff uh, DEI training with Dr. Townsend. So this was a priority that we had last year to really understand people who are coming to the court and understanding, you know, the court, court is a scary place that everybody doesn't always understand. So to try to be as mindful of that when folks come in. So thank you. Uh, for our future goals, 2024 future goals, we're going to really hope that e-filing is up and running. Uh, another partnership with the the municipal court is hopefully we'll have an eviction expungement um, avenue to allow people who have been evicted to expunge that from their records. Currently, right now, we remove those records uh, off the internet within three years. So, if it, after three years, we'll take that off the internet. Hopefully, with an ability to uh, 
seal eviction records. It will really be impactful. Uh, I know a lot of the members in the eviction space, uh, they call it a scarlet E. When you go through that process, you won't be able to then get another um, application to a landlord and obtain housing. So with this avenue, hopefully that will remove some of those barriers. Uh, we've also, with the partnership of the Dayton Municipal Court and the five judges there and the public defender's office have worked to develop a homelessness court and hopefully we'll be able to accomplish that here in the next year. Uh, we're looking to continue to build community partnerships, which will um, be helpful and uh, allow us to really get more out in the community and make the court more accessible to everybody involved. A big priority of mine is to update forms and publications to plain language. Uh, we as attorneys and clerks and courts, we operate with a lot of legalese. So people are not always understanding of what is occurring in their cases. So a real priority is to lower that reading level and not use as much legalese. A lot of our summons and other things have just walls of text on them that I could assure that I don't know this for a fact, but I imagine that a lot of people just throw those out because it's just too much information on there. So really prioritizing what information is on those things and getting people uh, to show up appear for court and know what's what's going on with their case. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to move more of our documents from our uh, self-help center online. Currently, right now, we have them online. It is just a little confusing to get to those documents. So we're hopeful that we'll continue to make these things available online in different languages and everything else like that. Uh, so that is another priority we have. Excuse me, Mr. Harris. Yes, ma'am. Um, could you expound a little bit on homeless court? Homeless court. Uh, so with the Dayton Municipal Court, it is going to be a program where individuals that are sent through uh, homelessness agencies are able to then go through this program, hopefully have their fines reduced, and then dismiss at that point. <laughs> so that it's going to, it's in partnership with the Public Defender's Office and a couple other of the homelessness agencies. And hopefully a lot of these things will be starting in January of next year and then moved on. So here with this chart, you'll see a, a map of the zip codes and really the, the clinics and where we have the most areas with warrant blocks and other things preventing folks from getting medicines in some cases. As you can see here in the population, most of it is going to be 45406, 45417, uh, and 45103. Those are going to be our highest leveled areas. Uh, we mostly this past year have served folks all across the city. The highlights of that is going to be 45417, 45406, 45405. Uh, next year, we are prioritizing trying to locate some partners in 45403 and hopefully having more clinics out in that part of town over there in uh, 45403. And this is just going to be a brief history of record feeling. In the state of Ohio in 1974, the first provision to seal cr uh, certain criminal records was enacted in 1990. That change expanded the definition to first-time offender. In 2012, the General Assembly allowed one felony, one misdemeanor, or two misdemeanors to be sealed. That was then expanded again in 2018, expanded the eligible offender list, and was allowing more types of offenses to be able to be expunged. Uh, and sealed in 2021, sealing of an unlimited number of F5s, F4 offenses permitted, and a new pathway for other things were established, and the period that you needed to wait to apply was also reduced. Uh, in 2022, the Senate bill eliminated a lot of things and uh, eliminated eligible offenders, and it really expanded the ability to expunge and seal certain records. So if you see what we have done in the past, um, 11 years, we started out expunging or sealing about 332 cases, and now we're up to about 900 this year. 
I think we've exceeded that 900 this uh, this past week or so. And I, I anticipate that would be up close to 1,000 by the end of 2023. So with the next couple of months here, we'll be able to get past that 1,000. All right, we'll go to your guys' priorities here, equity inclusion lens. Uh, we'll continue to provide services to the community through the expungement of Dayton Municipal Court records and the sealing of those records. There are currently uh, 1,229 pending evictions uh, in the city of Dayton. Remote eviction expungement program will really be focusing on trying to get folks that are in the pipeline some help that they need. Uh, the evictions are something that is increased throughout the entire region. Um, I know Kettering's Municipal Court has also seen a big increase, and it's likely to continue with uh, the crunch that people are feeling right now after the pandemic. Mm -hmm. yeah. We know that we're what are you seeing across your desk? Is it non-payment or is it... The so in the state of Ohio, every you get an immediate cause of action if you don't pay your rent. So usually there could be something underlying that, but the landlord's always going to fi file because they haven't paid the rent. So that is probably the biggest root cause is not paying the rent. But I can't for sure say that. Right now with our current case management system, we don't have a way of tracking that information. With our new one, we're hopefully able to track why the, the causes are actually there. And then I'd be able to provide more data upon that. Okay. Uh, we'll continue to support the community with record sealing and expanding access to expungement of criminal records. That is a big priority of mine is to really uh, help folks clean up those, those records. And it, it's really been helpful to have such a great partnership with uh, the Dayton Municipal Court, especially Judge Logan, who's really uh, taking a lead on that as well. The Ohio legislators have greatly expanded a, a ability, eligibility for record sealing and expungements. I don't believe a lot of people know that and that we have to continue to be able to promote these events and get out there and really let people know that, you know, if you do have something preventing you, there are avenues to get those removed that prevents you from getting a job and then hopefully return back to a productive member of society. Uh, to expand access and awareness of the the expungement ability, eligibility. So we're going to be doing that with social media, uh, marketing partners, and other, and using census data, hopefully, to really identify where we're going to go about impacting and the best ways to do that. Uh, and we'll continue to provide services to the community through community drives, license, driver's license clinics, and criminal expungement clinics. Uh, one of the biggest areas we have are these driver's license clinics. Uh, folks usually, uh, the reason they don't have a driver's license is because they get on a, a hamster wheel and then they can't get off. Uh, they'll have court fines from pretty much every municipal court here in Dayton. When we go to these clinics, it's usually Vandalia cases. Dayton Municipal is usually the largest amount of cases. And then Kettering will have cases in Miamisburg. And pretty much if you drive in Dayton, you're driving through one of several different municipal courts. And usually you'll have a case in each one. And then you'll also, on top of those cases, have BMV reinstatement fees, which sometimes can get into the tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, usually the BMV will let you work on a payment plan to get that license and try to get you a license, but it is, it's a difficult thing once you're on to get off. Of. So that is a priority and we're always looking for ways to make the most impact. What type of numbers do you have for those who are uh, driving who have never had a license? I don't know if we have numbers on that. I could talk to BMV. I don't think we'll have really uh, vetted data on how many of those folks have never had a license. I can say that a lot of people in Dayton drive without their license. Right. It's a tremendous amount of folks. I know. If you don't have your driver's license, then you won't have insurance. So if somebody hits you, you're likely won't have insurance to go collect. And that, you know, that impacts the entire community. 
And um, this is information about, about 10 years ago. And um, it was reflective of um, schools, for example, not having free driver education programs. And they could never find this had accessibility to a car. And one of them being stopped once, and they uh, see the physically being stopped again, they tend to flee. And then they get another ticket, and get another ticket, and then it starts piling up, like they said, getting on the little, the little cartwheel. And so, a uh, massive problem is one of the things that, too, that also prevents them from trying to get the job. Mm -hmm. Some jobs that would require you to have a driver's license to be able to function and carry out those things as well. Uh, but, uh, you know, just curious in terms of what some. Yeah, I mean, this is America. A lot of our, our jobs and everything is you have to have a car to get there. So, I mean, that is a reality that I don't think we always address that, you know, we are a very car based society and folks need to get places they're going to drive a car. It doesn't matter if they have a license. Maybe they get a pilot license to drive from the air tax. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> are there any other questions? No? All right, fantastic. I'll turn it over to Judge Logan here in the Dayton Municipal Court. Right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk through the numbers real quick and then go ahead and go. Try. <laughs> So this is the last program area in the CSA under just and safe city priority. Uh, personnel budget is up 3.5% when compared to 2023 for the municipal court. And that is in line with the wage growth uh, that's occurring in 2024. Contracts and material budget, however, it is down 50.2%. And that 50.2% is inclusive of CNM, which is $660,000, and capital, which is $171,000. Um, the largest contributing factor to that decrease is the court's case management system. Uh, the reduction in the maintenance cost in 2024 compared to 2023 is driving that increase. And now I will hand it over to Jerry Logan. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome back to Marty. So yeah. can yeah. uh -huh. Good morning, um, Mayor, Commissioners, City Manager. Um, I'm going to start by just, um, again, giving you an overview of the Dayton Municipal Court. We are the judicial arm of government. We consist of five elected judges, two appointed magistrates, and about 60 staff people. And those people cover the bailiff's office, the magistrate's office, court administration, probation, pretrial, electronic home detention, community service, and restitution. And as, as we function as the court, um, you know, we're not this mysterious entity. You know, most people are scared to come to court. They're not familiar with it. We think that we we are a uh, kinder, gentler court, and we try to make the experience not so scary. And our primary goal is to administer justice. We want to handle cases fairly, timely, and in accordance with the law. So in that respect, we, we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis who did it and how, following the law, looking at the facts. But when we administer justice, we're really looking at the why. And a lot of our um, things that we do in our court is to address the why so we can impact behavior so we don't have this treadmill of people coming in. And our jurisdiction is established statutorily. We, our courts are set from um, um, Ohio state law. We deal with people 18 and over for traffic and criminal cases. We, every day I have someone in front of me who has to get to school. Can you take care of my case? That's sad. We have the jurisdiction of civil cases. Uh, and those civil cases include evictions, um, small claims, photo enforcement that we've talked about here today, um, and anything that that comes out of a eviction, anything that comes out of a uh, small claims, um, garnishments, things like that. We also deal with criminal traffic, tr criminal and traffic cases. Now, 
Marty has indicated in his presentation that the criminal and traffic cases are are are, are down. And I would say the numbers may be down, but the complexity is not. It's like peeling an onion. There are so many layers to these cases, it's sad. We have our jurisdiction starting from arraignment, pretrials, trials, um, preliminary hearings for felonies if they have them, um, all post-conviction motions. And I am telling you that every week at arraignment, we see people who are actively engage in some type of mental breakdown, mental crisis, or actively um, under the influence of drugs or alcohol. It is a real problem. And so these cases become more complicated. They It may be a criminal trespass, but the layers on that case, it's issues for the prosecutor, issues for defense, and as judges, we have to figure out how to deal with them in a manner that, again, the why to impact some behaviors. And so we're proud of the um, um, resources that we've used at the, um, to, to, to address some of these things. Um, a mental health docket, um, domestic violence classes. We are working with the... Um, Public Defender's Office and Marty and some of the social service agencies to create this homeless court. I don't like that name. We're looking for a better yeah, name. Better name. <laughs> uh, what they call it, it. They call it that, but it's, it's, we have to find something better. Um, judge Spells will be the judge of contact for that. And she is ready to start that docket in December of this year. Um, we have um, worked with them to get the process together. And basically, to answer your question, it's to help homeless people get from um, homelessness to stable housing. And it is to clear up fines, court costs, and fees, which often prevents them from getting a license, which prevents them from getting a job. And uh, that's how that works. And we're just on the tail end of that. So everything that you hear today from the clerk, and the clerk is the keeper of our record. Um, everything that we do in court um, is funneled to the clerk of courts, and they are responsible for keeping accurate and complete records for the court. Uh, and so some of the things that, that Marty has talked about that he does in the community is really over and above what his elected position does, and we appreciate that. And then we work with the prosecutor's office as well. Some of our accomplishments in 2003, I mean 2023, I've already talked about, but I'm just gonna say that um, Judge Garris will be leaving the bench this year. It's not an accomplishment, it's a sad thing, but we're gonna um, usher in a new judge in 2024. Uh, we've worked, with the operations of our court to do case management and some other things that are listed there. Um, in terms of future goals, we're still working with the case management system to get that up and running. Uh, that's gonna be such a welcome relief. We still um, seek out grants and as much grant funding as we can and we'll continue to do that. Again, we're going to welcome a new judge. Kind of talked about the public trust and all that. Um, we continue to be on call 24 hours a day. The judges work six days a week. We rotate our Sundays um, to process anyone who has been incarcerated from Friday at about 4 o'clock to any time on Sunday morning. Uh, funding opportunities, they're there. We, we again, seek out grants. We um, fund certain programs through our court costs and fees. Some of our uh, costs for the court, of course, is from general fund, but we do try to seek out other, other funding to take care of some of the things that the court can deal with. In terms of diversity and inclusion, um, one of the biggest things about diversity and inclusion is that we try to make the court 
uh, accessible. We host um, leadership groups like uh, Dayton Leadership, Priority, I mean, uh, Parity, um, Dayton Chamber of Commerce Leadership. They come in on a regular basis. They see how the court operates. They see how the court interfaces with the police, um, the jail, other community leaders. Internally, we try to keep a diverse staff. Um, anyone who, who is using the Dayton Municipal Court, we want them to, to leave that court feeling like we have adequately um, given, given them adequate time to present their case, that it was timely, and that it's fair. So whether you're a defendant or a victim, a plaintiff or a defendant, that all cases have been judged fairly. And that's just a part of our ongoing process. And, uh, and all, a lot of our um, diversity inclusion is rooted in, in the programs that we do in the court as well. I think that's it. Okay, commissioners, we've come to our mid-morning break. I want to thank the staff who helped present and uh, the justice uh, presentations. I am going to suggest we start up at 1120. It gives you a seven minute bio break. <laughs> the next section is longer than justice. And so trying to protect some of a lunch hour break. Um, I want to get us back here at 1120 so that we can keep rolling through the, the budget presentation for you.